Welcome to Grace Church. I'm Jordan and this is Ian and we are now the Kennedys. We just got married about a month ago. We're really glad you're joining us this Sunday and hope that wherever you're participating, you'll feel a part of who we are as Grace Church. We wanted to remind everyone that you can follow along with the learning guide, which you can find on the Grace website. And it's also a great place to learn about us as a church. And then if you can also have crackers and juice, we'll take communion together later at the end of the service. Again, we're really glad that you're joining us today. Bye. Hey, good morning, Grace Church. Um, welcome once again to the hidey hole under my stairs. Um, you know, I thought about recording this week's worship set in my bathroom because of the better acoustics, but, you know, I couldn't have y'all see my toilet paper stash, obviously, so we are once again under the stairs. Um, man, I miss y'all a ton, and, you know, I think I said it last time I... Um, did worship. I I miss y'all, but there's something really soothing to my soul about knowing we're all coming together and worshiping at the same time, the same God. Um, I don't know. That's like, it. it is an encouragement to me, and it's something that's kept me sane during um, these weeks of quarantining. So if y'all would, um, do whatever is most worshipful for you at your house. Drink your coffee, sit down, stand up, dance, do whatever. Um, we're going to worship together. So here we go. I forgot the key.
shout out, shout out, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and let all that's within me shout out, shout out, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and let all that's within me shout out, shout out, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and let all that's within me in me shout out shout out have your way God have your way have your way have your way God have your way have your way God, thank you. Um, thank you for our little corner of church that we call Grace. Um, thank you that that you allow us to, to meet together, to be together, even when we can't physically touch one another. I'm reminded of Ecclesiastes, where he, he talks about um, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. And, and I guess this is one of those times where we refrain from embracing, but... God, you are good and you are with us in all of it. Um, so I thank you. Thank you that you are good. Um, in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, Grace kids and families. I miss seeing you. I have a bunch of toys up at church that are very lonely and need someone to play with them. I think I might start boxing up some of them and bringing them to your houses for you to play with and borrow for a little bit. We'll see if that that project happens next week. Um, this week we're learning about the disciples who are starting the first churches and part of what we learned they were doing was spreading good news. So this is a great time for all of us to be sharing good news with each other. In the learning guide this week there are several ideas. You might want to put some chalk art out on a sidewalk or street in front of where you live. You might want to do a display in a window. I know Milo's family did a really cool sign of hope in their front window. You might want to write a letter to someone that you're missing and just let them know that they're not alone and that you care about them and that God sees them and cares for them also. You also could take a challenge to send a picture from your phone to someone using an app that is linked on our learning guide. So share with us what you're doing and um, don't be surprised at the feedback you might get. It's really interesting to hear when how people respond to good news. So I hope to see you soon. Bye. Good morning, Grace Church. It's really great to be gathered with you here in this space this morning. As we all gather in our homes and the places where we live, we are gathered together, as Bailey said earlier in this time. You know, books and movies and campfire huddles are full of tales of secret maps and treasure hidden. It's easy for us to come to think of the Bible in similar terms, um, or an instruction map, a, a road map of sorts, giving instructions on how to find the treasure, how to make it to heaven. But Jesus is explicit in his instructions to all of us who would be his apprentices, his disciples. And that instruction is to follow him. He doesn't say, read about me. He says, follow me. And it's how we respond to this invitation this command from Jesus that marks us as Christians. But how do we follow a risen Messiah, one who is not bodily present 
with us? How are we to understand the Bible more as an invitation into a discussion on this following than a static map we're trying to figure out on our own? Well, might I suggest that it starts with asking questions and letting the Bible ask us questions in return. Last summer, we dove into the first half of the book of Acts, the story of the earliest followers of Jesus, and what they did in response to Jesus' command to go into all the nations and preach the gospel. We asked questions and considered the questions the stories were asking us. Us asking Acts, Acts asking us. Ryan did a great video that you, you'll see there in the learning guide that will refresh your memory. Um, I also want to encourage you, just go back and read the first 13 chapters. Just sit down and find some space and read them all the way through to bring you to where we are. But we're letting this, this book ask us questions as we ask it. 21st century American questions. What are the questions it's asking us in our context where we are? How might we follow more faithfully this Jesus? Well, today we pick up the conversation in the second part of that book. And man, it's got some questions for us. It's got some questions to ask that we need to ask and that need to be asked to us. This study will take us through the rest of the summer <clears throat> as we ask serious questions about what kind of church we are becoming in this time of quarantine. What is it revealing about it? What is it about us? What is it forming in us? As well as what kind of church should we be as we emerge from it? So pray with me this morning. Jesus, we want to follow you. That's the command. And we know we so easily interpret that mistakenly, what that means. So God, the Holy Spirit, speak to us. Lead us into all truth this morning. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, a mind to discern, and a heart to love and obey. And more than anything, Jesus, let us follow you more closely, more faithfully, more passionately through this time together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so our context, we've jumped out of the book of Mark. We finished the book of Mark, and now we're back in Acts. There are a lot, look, Acts has its own little industry of maps and timelines and things like that. Um, they're all over the internet. They're all in your commentaries and stuff. So I encourage you as we go through this summer to, to make use of those things, uh, find out where they are. But to start with, I want to try something a little bit differently today. Um, I want everyone to pull out your Bible. I'll give you a sec to do this. If you, if you need to get that physical copy of the Bible or, uh, pull it up on your app. Um, one of the, one of the versions that we use a lot of grace, um, as a good study tool is called the NET Bible, the net Bible. Um, it's available for free. Um, it's got great study notes with it. Translation notes primarily, which is what's really makes it great for um, our job of interpreting as a team where the words come from, why they were chosen, certain words were chosen. But grab your Bible, and then what I want you to do is turn to chapter 14, and I want you to read that aloud where you are. I don't want you to listen to me read it. I want you to read it. I want you to hear yourself saying the words, others around you, hear, let your kids hear them, your people that you're um, quarantining with. Hear the words. So we'll give you uh, a minute here to read those words in Acts chapter 14.
Amen. So I'm not sure if you read that off the screen, if you read it out of a Bible, um, a physical Bible, if you read it off a, an app. I pulled this off my shelf. So this was my grandfather's Bible. And I don't, I don't handle it often because it is literally disintegrating. The, le the leather cover is disintegrating as I handle it. Um, of course, King James Version, with all the notes and things. He, he was gifted this by the class, all the men who, uh, who gave it to him signed the front. Uh, there's interesting little Bible study notes inside it. And also, I found this morning, I, I must have seen it before, but my baptism certificate from 1971 uh, was stuck among the pages here. I, I'll, I'm guessing that my parents sent sent it to my grandfather. I remember going with my grandfather to the First Baptist Church of Hope, Arkansas, where he was a deacon, and uh, them dressing me up, my grandmother and grandfather dressing me up and showing me off. And uh, We'd exit and shake the pastor's hand and then immediately turn to the side and my grandfather would light up a cigarette with all his buddies and they would sit there and talk about the sermon and the day and the things going on. And while I waited uh, for them to have their post sermon cigarette outside on right on the front steps of the first Baptist church there, um, different times, y'all, uh, different way of following different way of understanding, um, what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. Uh, but I think it's an apt metaphor for sometimes how we approach the Bible and those who followed before us. It's like examining an ancient artifact or an old black and white movie, studying a lost civilization for mysterious clues, things from a different age that we have to decipher instead of something alive, active, and fresh among us, leading us forward as much as it connects us to the past, inviting us into the very present practice of following God right here, and right now. In our text, we find Barnabas and Paul in quite a situa situation. They think they're saying one thing, but soon find out people are hearing something quite different. And this is among the many questions we ask, how about us? Do you ever feel like you've really nailed it, given a thorough and complete ex explanation of something? And then you watch people interpret it in exactly the opposite way you meant. Look, if we think Paul and Barnabas were the only ones who had this problem, we are mistaken. This, this is something that continually we encounter, is people come saying or thinking they're saying one thing, or people hearing something differently. Of course, we saw this over and over again with Jesus, right? He would be saying one thing and the people hearing something else or hearing it in a different way. We all experience in our lives both misunderstanding and being misunderstood. And so in our study this week, I think it's important. I think it's asking us, as we ask it, what is it that Paul and Barnabas were trying to convert the people to here? Now, this is where it comes really important to go back and read the first 13 chapters. Because the first chapters of Acts deal, they give long treatises on the interpretation the early church had of who Jesus was and what his message was. Now we see his messengers going out and doing this. But the message, the way they proclaim it, and the things that they emphasize change. They, they encounter certain situations and they contextualize the message to get it across. And so we need to ask, well, how does Paul and Barnabas's message line up with Peter and John and Andrew back in the first things? How does it line up with Jesus? Because what this does is it, it helps us as we understand how do we escape the gravitational pull of what we already think is true. Truth doesn't change, but our interpretation of truth is constantly evolving. Our understanding of it, as we apply it, as we grow older, as we see it um, lived out in different lives in different situations, our understanding of truth is always changing with that. And so in order to stay on track, in order to follow appropriately, we have to recognize the biases, the lenses that we layer onto the gospel. 
And one way we help remove those or uncover them or at least become aware of them is by watching how this transitions through the book of Acts. And when we see the things that we've layered on, that we've wrapped the gospel in with, that maybe actually distort it or keep people from understanding or, or put the, the, the center of the followership on us, we become the hero of the story, not Jesus. Our way becomes a way of doing things, not the Jesus way. Well, then we have a responsibility to unwrap those things, to lay them aside, and to go back and ask these questions. What is the gospel? What does it mean to follow Jesus right here, right now? What did it mean to our ancestors? What does it mean for us? What is it going to mean for our children? You see, because we all of us fall into two different um, extremes here. And we see this, we see this emphasized in our text between the Judaizers and the Gentiles, right? Is the Judaizers, they were trying to take Jesus and make him a good observant Jew. They were trying, to, and they were trying to make everyone who followed Jew, Gentile, become Jews first and then follow Jesus. And this is the great clash that we're going to see that we've already seen it. And it's going to continue with Paul. He's continually going to be contending with them. He's, he, he reserves his harshest criticism for the Judaizers. But there's another extreme on the other side. The people they, they want to make, they want to fit Paul and Barnabas into the pagan pantheon of Greek gods. Zeus and Hermes, they want to they want to make them, they want to Gentilize them just as much as the Jews want to Jewish eyes Jesus, Christianity. <clears throat> Friends, we have to ask ourselves, I think the text is asking us, in what ways are we doing the same things? In what ways do we try to make people perform to a certain religious standard, like the Judaizers, before they can follow Jesus? Like we say, oh yes, the gospel is for everybody, but first you have to do this. First you have to agree with us on this. First you have to behave the way we behave on this. And then you can be part. Or we do the likewise. We just say, hey, man, this is just one more way. That's awesome. Let's, let's just put you up here in the lineup with all the other gods, all the other ways of living. Jesus is cool. Just one more way of doing that. You just live it out however you want. You just do whatever you want. That's fine. We'll just, we'll just baptize it with his worldly, secular, whatever word you want to use which I'm not real fond of those terms, but, but taking Jesus out of the context of who Jesus really is. You see, people are asking questions and people are offering answers, but the gospel is the only one that does both in a way that ultimately brings life. That's why it's so important for us to get this right. The gospel is the only answer that ultimately brings life but we have to continually be refining and going back to that and looking at the ways that it gets layered over, distorted. So what's our gospel? What motivates us to share that good news with others? What are we trying to save people from and to? Because Jesus is the way, the only way. And following Jesus and rejecting every other God, guru, or game plan is what it means to be a Christian. But how do we walk that out in our context here, today, in quarantine, post-quarantine? How do we do that? We had a great discussion this week about the relationship between our assumptions regarding people's belief and how we judge their actions. Laura commented that in our context, it seems the assumption is that if your doxy, your thinking, your way of thinking is correct, then your praxis or your, your life, your actions will match up with ours because, of course, we have it all figured out. And then if you behave aberrantly, if you don't live the way we do, well, then your beliefs must be corrupt. We do that so quickly without examining truly what it is we believe and why we are acting the way we are. In other words, we look at people and assume if they believe correctly, they'll behave like I do. And we, we make our own actions, our own culture, the center of the standard instead of what we're encountering in Scripture, instead of what the Holy Spirit is leading us to do. 
Ryan pointed out how hollow this is. He commented, our opinions are really well formed, but our lives are not marked by peace. A lot of opinions out there, y'all. Not a lot of peace. Friends, there has to be another way, and I believe the other way is practiced by asking and letting Scripture ask us. Are we really walking in the way of Jesus? Are we really being formed by the living Spirit of God that is leading us into all truth? Or are we letting the truth we think we know quench the Spirit? Have we, just like the people of Lystra in our text, sought to make gods out of Paul and Barnabas by enshrining their conclusions for their time in the, as the pinnacle of the pantheon of our orthodoxy? Or are we listening to them? Do you hear what they're saying? They're saying, don't follow us. Follow Jesus. They're saying, we are not the Holy Spirit. We follow the Holy Spirit. And it is so easy for us to fall into this same trap and make Paul and Barnabas God instead of God, God's self. I got to tell you, I was pretty convicted as I was reading and preparing this week about how likewise I, I'm ready to grab a bull, a garland, and go out to the city gates and anoint the latest commentary, commentator or theologian or philosopher as a god instead of seeing what they're doing, which is leading us deeper into an encounter with the person of the Holy Spirit, the alive and risen God, because we cannot follow a God who is dead. We cannot follow a God that we can only know by reading a book. We cannot follow a God that we only know about. We have to know that God. And in Jesus, we can, because the Spirit is alive today. Jesus said it himself. He said, it is better for you that I go, that I leave, because then I'll send the Holy Spirit. We'll lead you into all truth. That has to be real. That's our hope. And so let us not be like either the Judaizers, who said you have to conform to our religious cultural practices before you can become one of us, but also not like the Gentiles here, who enshrine certain thoughts, certain ways in the pantheon and make them equal with God. Instead, let us look to those who have gone before us and let them ask us the tough questions as we ask them questions as well. One of the ways that we encounter and experience that spirit of the living God is through communion. And so Jordan and Ian reminded you at the first to grab your elements <clears throat> I long for the day we can do this together, y'all, in person, but we can do it together here today. You see, Jesus knew that. He knew that his going away physically was going to represent a problem. We need to see something. We need to taste it. We need to, we need to feel it. And so he gave us this. He gave us himself, symbolized and embodied in the, in the bread and in the juice, in the cup, and in the plate. The things we have to do daily, daily because we forget easily. And on that last night that Jesus was with his disciples, he took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body. Take and eat and do this in remembrance to remember. So even though we are separated by space right now, we are remembered, we are pulled back together, we are made one as we take this together. Likewise, as he took the cup, he said, this is the blood of my new covenant poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. There's nothing that separates us. That is the promise that as we submit ourselves to God, there is nothing that separates us from God. We are one with each other and we are one with God. So take now and eat and drink.
This is also a time where we take an offering. We do that as an act of worship. We do that as symbolic that there is no one here who does not have something to give. You can give by clicking on the, the link in the learning guide or there they'll put it up on the side in the comments on the Facebook feed. But also that none of us are without need. All of us have needs. They're being revealed right now, especially. As a church, we are trying to respond as sacrificially and as generously and as quickly as we can to some of those needs. Some of us in our community, in our Grace community, are suffering terribly economically uh, through this time. We need to have the resources to share, and all of us have something to do with that. And the last thing is this, this is where we respond. Don't let this morning just be more information. Let it motivate you. Let it sink into you to ask questions and to act on where God is leading you. Look, it's great to have the testimony of those who have gone before us. It's invaluable. We have to have it. But it is to point us towards a future. It is to lead us into this present experience of the living God, the same God that they encountered, we encounter today. So let's act on that as we go forward into this week. Grace and peace, y'all. Give me strength 
to keep them raised you have said you hold me close and you will not look away no you will not look away so with dirt on my face and dust in my lungs I choose worship and when my shame has covered my soul I choose worship and when my grief has taken my tongue I choose worship oh I choose worship and with dirt on my face and dust in my lungs I choose Worship and when my shame has covered my song, I choose worship and when my grief has taken my tongue, I choose worship oh I choose worship. And I choose worship I choose the faithful way And I choose worship I choose to give you praise I choose worship But what I alone can give to you, a grateful heart I give, a thankful prayer I pray, a wild dance I dance before you, a loud song I sing, a huge bell I ring, a life of praise I live before you, a grateful heart I give, a thankful prayer I pray. Wild dance. 
I dance before you the loud song I sing the huge bell I ring a life of praise I live before you many men will pour their gold serve a thing that shines many men will read your words but they will never change their minds I will not forget you are oh my God my king with a thankful heart I bring my offering and my sacrifices not what you can give but what I alone can give to you, a grateful heart I give, a thankful prayer I pray, a wild dance I dance before you, a loud song I sing, a huge bell I ring, a life of praise I live before you, a grateful heart I give, a thankful prayer I pray. Wild dance, I dance before you. A loud song I sing, a huge bell I ring, a life of praise I live before you. Gotta get a little wild sometimes, gotta get a little wild sometimes. 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 I will not forget you. Oh my God, my King, with a thankful heart I bring my offering and my sacrifices, not what you can give, but what I alone can give to you. Grace Church, my name is Becky, and I'm going to recite the benediction for us today. May the God of endurance and encouragement let us live in harmony so that we may together, even when we are apart, lift up with one voice praise and glory to the Father of Jesus Christ. Amen. Gotta get a little wild sometimes. 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 I will not forget you, oh my God, my King. With a thankful heart I bring my offering and my sacrifices. Not what you can give, but what I alone can give to you.